All right, as I said, we pretty much finished 1 Samuel chapter 11 last week. That, of course, is going to be our springboard into chapter 12. We are going to be at a national gathering place in Gilgal. You'll locate these on the map that's in your handout. I try to give you a map whenever I can to help you to locate some geography in our studies. So we're going to have this national gathering at Gilgal. Remember chapter 11, the Ammonites were attacking the Israelites at Jabesh Gilead. That was all taking place on the east side of the Jordan River. The Ammonite kingdom would have risen up from the south on the east side of the Jordan River toward the north on that same east side. There they attacked Jabesh Gilead. The Israelites from Jabesh crossed the Jordan River to go over to the home territory of the new king, Saul. And that would have been amongst their distant brethren, their even family members. It was those who came from Jabesh Gilead who furnished wives for the tribe of Benjamin when they were almost wiped out. So these are relatives of a fairly close kind to them. They went over there to weep before them and to cry for help. The Ammonites let them go and look, but didn't think they'd come back with any support, but they did. And this is the first real test of King Saul as the new king, the first king. And he rose to the occasion, and he brought together troops of some 330,000. And they routed the Ammonites so that no two of them were left together. So after this great victory, now we get to this place in chapter 11, verse 14, when Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And so you have this national gathering. And when they renew the kingdom, you're going to notice some things that they do to accomplish that. One, they're going to proclaim Saul as the king. The first time they did that, back in chapter 10 at the end of that chapter, there were some worthless men. They didn't support the king. But after this victory over the Ammonites, now they do support the king. So now it's a unanimous vote of confidence for King Saul. So they renew the kingdom by proclaiming him king there in a unanimous way. Then they offer sacrifices to God. So they renew their covenant with God. They unanimously stand behind King Saul. They're at peace with one another. So they fix problems with each other, they fix problems with God, and then they rejoice together. That's all part of renewing the kingdom. Part of renewing the kingdom is also going to be in chapter 12. They need to agree to confess about the truth. And chapter 12 is laid out in a way that is going to remind them of how they got to where they're at. And they need to confess that. They need to admit the truth about that. So in chapter 12, you're going to have somewhat of a judicial scene. Samuel is going to lay out for them his innocence. He's been faithful ever since he was a boy, being raised up among them, beginning to lead them as a judge, as a priest, He's been faithful. No charge can be brought against Samuel. That's in the first five verses. Then he proclaims the faithfulness of God. And nobody can argue that. Samuel's innocent. God's innocent. But then he goes on to say, you as a nation have been unfaithful. That's the next part of chapter 12. So he talks about how they've had a practice of unfaithfulness toward God. That's what got them where they're at. We want a king to reign over us. This is how they arrived there. Now they've sinned against God again, just the way their ancestors have done in the past, as they've done currently. And Samuel gives them a strict warning. 
All right, here's your king. But then he gives them some conditional statements. If you do this, if you do that, it's going to go well for you. It'll be all right. You can come back from this. And then the people end up repenting, and they plead with Samuel to continue to pray for them. That's how chapter 12 is laid out. So we are ready now to get into chapter 12, unless there are comments from chapter 11. Anything that you want to bring up from last week that we didn't have time for? All right, then we are on to chapter 12. Let's look at the first five verses. Samuel is going to be identifying in these first 11 verses the innocent ones, and he's number one on the list. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I've listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I've appointed a king over you. Now here is the king walking before you, but I'm old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you, and I've walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. They said, You've not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you found nothing in my hand. And they said, He is witness. I don't know what Samuel meant when he said, you know, here I am, I'm old and I'm gray. And behold, here's my sons. I don't know what that behold, here's my sons means because he knew his sons were unfaithful. He didn't ask them if they could charge anything against his sons because they could. Behold, here's my sons. But they were wicked men. But he asked them concerning himself, what about me? Have I defrauded you? Have I taken anything I shouldn't take? Have I taken a bribe so that my eyes have been blinded and I have proclaimed some injustice because I took a bribe? They couldn't find one thing against Samuel. He was a little boy when he was delivered to Eli. And from that point onward, they found no accusation against him. Nothing. And so he is proclaiming his innocence. It's nothing he did. Where they're at has nothing to do with who Samuel is, what he's done, as though he's done something wrong to lead them this way. He has not. And they say that God and his anointed are witness to that exact thing. Now he goes on and talks about... Uh, God's innocence, verses 6 through 8. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So now take your stand, that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did for you and your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt, and settled them in this place. This has been God's activity. Now drop down to verse 11, please. Then the Lord sent Jeroboam. Who's Jeroboam? Another name for Gideon. That's right. And Bedan. Anybody have a footnote or another name for Bedan? Barak. Remember uh, Deborah? And her helper there as they were in battle against the enemy. So the Lord sent Jeroboam. He sent Bedan, maybe Barak. 
and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around so that you lived in security. This has been God's behavior among you. And to me, I'm amazed by this. And uh, as a preacher, I guess I'm a little bit ashamed of it that Samuel could condense all of that history into those few little lines. You realize he just covered from the time they entered Egypt to the hundreds of years they spent there, they cried out, he sends Moses, he sends Aaron, they come out of there through the wilderness, Moses leading them into the land of Canaan, through all the period of the judges, 350 or more years, he's covered all that time. in just a few lines. As a preacher, I'm amazed by that. It takes me forever to say anything, and you know it. And I'll tell you this, every Sunday morning, when I step down from the pulpit, I'm usually kicking myself on the way down that I went over time. And you say, well, why do you keep doing that? I don't know. I, there's just a certain amount that I, 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 I need to say. A certain amount to get the message from point A to point B, to be sure everybody gets it, everybody's on board, everybody understands it, because you're dealing with some who know and some who don't know, some who have never heard. And so you need to cover material in a way that sort of grabs everybody together and gets everybody on board so you can get there. And that 30 minutes is hard. But Samuel just condensed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in two or three verses. And I'm amazed by that. But I will say this. He's dealing with a group of people who are already on board about that. They already know all that information. So when he mentions just a few names, they have an automatic flashback of all of that history that they already know, have been brought up with it since they were little children, through the generations, they already know all of that. So just a few slight mentions, and all of that is flashback in their mind. They're with it. It's not as if they've never heard it. He has simply jogged their memory in the most abbreviated way that I've ever seen. And so he condenses that history of Israel from Egypt all the way into Canaan through the years of the judges. He condenses all of that, how the Lord heard their cries, heard their cries, heard their cries. Every time they sinned against him, he delivered them. God was faithful. Moses, Aaron, all of the judges. So now take your stand. He tells them that. He tells them that in verse 7. And he tells them that in verse 16. So now take your stand. Look at that phrase. Look at it in verse 7. Look at it in verse 16. What do you think he means by that? So now take your stand. How would you say it and mean the same thing? Any ideas? Any other translations say it any differently? I haven't looked at them all. Stand still. Be still. Be still and listen. I want you to take your stand. I want you to be still. I want you to listen. And correct me if you can. Just take your stand and listen to this and acknowledge that this is the truth. So he challenges them this way, and they listen to it, and they can't say any different. They know he's telling it the way that it is. So 
Now they're taking their stand, they're being quiet, they're giving good attention. Now he goes on to God's people. Here's my history with you, verses 1 through 5. Here's God's history with you, verses 6 through 8 and verse 11. Now, here's your history with me, and here's your history with God. So take your stand and listen to this. Verse 9 and verse 10. But they forgot the Lord their God. So he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And that list could go on. They were unfaithful. So God sold them into the hand of this one, that one, the other one, the next one, the one after that, over and over and over again until they learned their lesson, cried out to the Lord, and then the Lord raised up these judges and delivered them. So, verse 10, they cried out to the Lord and said, we've sinned, we've sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. So Samuel tells them, this has been your history. I've been faithful. God's been faithful. You have been unfaithful over and over and over and over again. And every time you did it, it got you into trouble. Trouble. An enemy was risen up against you as discipline from the Lord. That's been your pattern. That's been your history. You forget God time and again. It's the reason you faced all those enemies. And every time you cried out in repentance, God delivered you. God's been good to you. The problem with the system is the people. The problem is not the Lord's design. The Lord's design was perfect. Sending them to Egypt to get out of that plague, out of that famine situation giving them a safe place in the land of Goshen to grow from about 75 people into a nation. A nation of over a couple million when they come out of Egypt. Giving them this safe land to dwell in, to get to that place. When it came time to come out, raising up Moses and Aaron to lead them down to Mount Sinai to get his law so they could understand his will provided food and water for them, and their clothes didn't wear out on the journey, brought them up to the land flowing with milk and honey. You know what happened there. So 40 years later, brings them there again, and they finally go in, and he's giving them victory over all their enemies, but they wouldn't fight all their enemies. They were afraid. So there ended up being a problem there. They get there and they start fussing and fighting and they start blending together with a culture of Canaan instead of standing for God and there's trouble there. But when they cry out in repentance, God delivers them. So the problem with the system is the people. It's not the Lord's design. If they would have stayed with God's design, it would have been perfect all the way through. Everything would have been great. They wouldn't have had any enemies raising up against them. So if you think about that, and you think about all the way forward to the church today, the problem with the system is always the people. It's not the Lord's design. If you want to talk about church growth, if you want to talk about evangelism, the problem is not the system. The problem is always the people. God's given us a message. He's given the power behind the message. God's given the way to carry out the mission of the Great Commission. Well, the church isn't growing. The church is shrinking. Evangelism isn't happening. The problem is not the system. The problem's always the people. The Lord's design is perfect. If God's people carry out the Great Commission, 
the growth and evangelism will happen just according to the Lord's design. If the people don't follow the Lord's design in that, if they make it this person's job or that person's job, but not my job, not our job, then the problem is the people, it's not the system. So if you want to talk about church growth and evangelism, God's design is perfect. If there's a problem, the problem is always with the people not carrying it out the way the Lord said. If we want to talk about unity, if we want to talk about church leadership, if we follow the Lord's design, it's going to go along like clockwork. But if we take shortcuts and try to do it some other way or want to obey this part of it but not that part of it, then the problem is the people, not the system that God has provided. If we want to talk about worshiping God in spirit and truth, the design is perfect. We don't need the bells and whistles. We don't need the stages and the shows. We don't need the band. We don't need the dancing. We don't need the clapping. Well, I just don't get much out of worship. The problem is not the system. It's always the people. Well, it doesn't seem to be exciting. It doesn't stir my heart. The problem is not the system. It's always the people. Then we start supplanting God's design, and we say, well, if maybe if we add this or we add that or we do it this way instead of that way, maybe that'll be better. Maybe that'll bring in the people. Maybe that'll be exciting. Maybe that'll draw the crowd. Maybe that will bring the unity. But all it does is put us in the place of the nation of Israel when they cried out for a king. Samuel said, I've been faithful. God's been faithful. The reason we got here, how we got here, where we're at today with you crying out for a king in this situation is because you have been unfaithful all the way through the centuries. From the past to the present, this is how we got here. So he's giving them a real warning about this. He's pointed out who's innocent. He's pointed out who's guilty. And now we're getting to this part in verses 12 through 18. Your comments, anything before we move on? Verses 12 through 18. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, here's the king whom you've chosen, whom you've asked for. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Conditional statement, If you will fear the Lord and serve Him and listen to His voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the King who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. Conditional statement number 2, verse 15. <clears throat> if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. History will repeat itself. Even now, verse 16, take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Stand still, stand in your place, listen, watch, observe, give good attention. Is not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that He may send thunder and rain. What's that do to a wheat harvest? That's not good. That's not good for the wheat harvest. Isn't today the wheat harvest? Then take your stand, watch this. I'm going to pray to the Lord, and He's going to send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you've done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. They thought their only threat was the Ammonites. 
or the Philistines. They thought that was their only threat. The Lord says, you forget who I am. Whether there's Ammonites or Philistines or Syrians or Assyrians or Egyptians or whoever it might be, I'm the creator. Guess who controls thunder, rain, sunshine, the moon, the stars, the heat, the cold, the changing of the seasons? You think that's all you've got to fear? I'm going to ask God to send thunder and rain in the wheat harvest, in the dry period of the land, when rain is unheard of, and when you're expecting to gather in your wheat for your livelihood to sustain you with food, don't forget who God is. Who controls all things? So Samuel called to the Lord and sent, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So with all that rich history, why would they ask for a king? With all that background of God's faithfulness, with seeing how everything's gone over the centuries. Every time they've gotten into trouble, it's because they forgot about God, rebelled against Him, did things their own way. Why would they ask for a king? Is it because Samuel's too old? That was a smokescreen. God has never left His people without a leader. That was a smokescreen excuse. Is it because His sons were wicked? That was a smokescreen. They're trying to concoct excuses to rebel against God and His design. So that wasn't really the issue. Samuel points out, here's the real problem. You are a stiff-necked and rebellious people, always have been and continue to be so, and that's how we got to where we're at today. They saw an enemy on the horizon and they decided they wanted a visible, tangible security. There's the Ammonites on the east. They just rose up against us. There's the Philistines on the west. They always rise up against us. So we want a king to be like the other nations around us. So we should be asking ourselves, what gives us the greatest sense of security? As enemies, foes of a variety of kinds are rising up against our lives, what gives us our greatest sense of security? 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19, warns Christians not to give undue consideration to riches, to wealth, to fix their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. What gives you the greatest sense of security? I like that when a bill comes in the mail and I look on my budget that I made for the year and I look on my budget and I can say, oh, that bill's covered. That money's in my bank account. I like that feeling. I like the feeling that when the bill comes in, it's in my budget, the money's in the bank, and I can pay for it. But don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. Who provides you with the body to have a job? Who provides you with health in that body to be about that business? Who gives you the roof over your head, the clothes on your back, the food on your table? Who makes all of that possible? Don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 25, talks about all the worries, all the anxieties that can encumber our lives. And we shouldn't give so much consideration to that 
But instead, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What gives you the greatest sense of security? I'm going to worry about all these things. And I'm going to make them the priority of my life. And God will be somewhere there in the background with the leftovers of me. But I'm going to be concerned about all these things. And I can't do this for His kingdom, and I can't do that for His kingdom because I'm so caught up with all these other things. And God says, no, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And in the course of events, God will take care of all those other things. They'll fall into place. It's all part of being a Christian first. You think about Luke chapter 12. And there was the farmer who had a bumper crop. What am I going to do? I don't, I don't have room in my barns. I know I'll, I'll build bigger barns. And I'll fill them up with all this good from all my crops. And I'm going to retire. I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. I'm just going to take my ease and, and sit in the lap of luxury of all that's in my barns. And then God said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Who's going to get all the stuff you put in your barns? Where's that? Because you can't take it with you, and it's not treasure in heaven, and it won't help you get into heaven. You haven't been rich toward God. You've been consumed with all this stuff in the world. Now you're going to die tonight, and none of that's going to benefit you. You're without God, and somebody else is going to get your stuff. What gives us the greatest sense of security? And the Israelites said, no, but we'll have a king. We'll have a king over us. And so God reminds them of the history and how they got to where they're at today, how they arrived there. God grants their request for a king. Going through all of this, and if you back up to chapter 7, chapter 8, where they're first asking for a king, and Samuel's distraught, and God says, Samuel, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. Listen to them. Do what they say. I'll give them a king, but you warn them. It's not going to go well. It's going to be encumbered with all kinds of problems. This is the manner of a king. This is the way it's going to go. They're not going to be happy. They're not going to like it. It's going to be full of problems. And now you get to this chapter. Here's their king. Here's the one God set over them. This is what they've asked for. God's given them the king they've asked for. But all the way through this, God was not happy about it. This was not God's design. This was not what he had provided for them. They went outside of that. They sought for another kind of security. So he's not pleased with it, but he gave them an earthly king. But it was not the best way, and it was not the right way. God said he was their king. He was their model for all of that. They wanted a different model. They wanted something else. They wanted something lesser than that. So when you think about how they asked for a king, and it was not God's design for a king, he was their king in the Old Testament, and Jesus is our king in the New Testament. But he listened to them, and he gave them the king they asked for. And then David comes along because after Saul failed, God pointed out the king you asked for was a king like the world around you. I'm going to give you a king now that's a man after God's own heart. It'd still be filled with sin, still be filled with trouble, but there was a character flaw that he was correcting from the kind of king they asked for. And that character flaw was that David was a man after God's own heart. Sinful, brought in a lot of trouble, a lot of problems, 
when he sinned. But God began to lead them back the right direction in that lineage. So they asked for a king, but it wasn't God's design. David comes along and he asked for a temple. God never asked for a temple. God asked for a tabernacle, a tent-like structure. David's the one who asked for a fixed building, a temple, not God's design. That's not what God had in mind. God's temple was going to be in the New Testament church. 1 Peter 2, we are a royal priesthood raising up a spiritual house made of living stones, and Christ is the chief cornerstone. That's the spiritual temple God had in mind. So David wanted a temple so bad, he just couldn't stand it. So God let him gather things for a temple that his son Solomon would build. But it wasn't God's design. David also invented instruments of music to bring into, to incorporate into the Old Testament worship. That was not God's design. That was David's idea. He wanted it so bad, he couldn't stand it. So God let him have the musical instruments. And God governed how they would be used and who would use them. The same with the temple. The same with the earthly king that they wanted. When they loathed the manna in the wilderness and cried out for meat, God gave them meat until it came out their nostrils. Not one day, not two days, not a week, but for a month they would eat meat until it came out their nostrils, became a plague to them and they would die. But God gave them the meat they were crying for. A lesson that we're learning in all of this is that not everything that God allows, not everything that He permits, not every prayer that He grants according to our asking is necessarily His will. Sometimes we become very stubborn, very rebellious, stuck in our ways, and we cry and we whine and we complain until God gives us what we've asked for. And most of the time it leads to sin and problems. And then we cry out to God and we ask for relief and in our repentance, He hears us. God's prophets have been faithful. God has been faithful. The problem is not the system. The problem is always the people. And whenever they rebel against God, it leads to catastrophe. And eventually they cry out from their stubborn position for help. And God hears them when they repent. So we're going to get down to the very end of this next week and introduce our next lesson sheet in next week's class. The next title of your handout is this. Jonathan Pokes a Bear. Won't that be interesting? How does Jonathan poke a bear? And what do you think the outcome of that's going to be? So we'll finish up this with the unanimous choice now of Saul as a king, some further warnings and descriptions of all of that, how they will stay in God's favor. By the way, realizing, and at this point, with the thunder and the rain coming on their precious wheat harvest, they realize they've sinned again. They've realized they've really, they just like their ancestors, they've really messed up again. What do you do when that happens? What do you do when you mess up? What do you do when you realize, all right, here I am. Look what I've done to myself. I've got myself in this fix. What do I do now? That's one of the loose ends we want to tie up next week because Samuel has an answer for that. And the people are ready to hear it. And they're ready to obey. So what do you do when you find yourself in that position? 
And this is going to be the way forward when we mess up in life. And of course, there's some applications for our current day in that because we find ourselves there all the time, don't we? All right, I got myself in a mess. What am I going to do? Is there a way forward? And the answer is yes, there's a way forward. But we have to be ready for the difficulty of that way and obedient to God in the process of it. Any final word before we dismiss class? Thanks for your good attention again. We are dismissed until the worship hour.